If you brought your Bible, we'll be in Luke 10. If you did not bring your Bible, there is probably a red one somewhere around you, in the row in front of you. Um, if not, just yell at someone in your row and they'll chuck one to you. I woke up this morning, just like you did. I woke up and I thought, oh good, I can just relax this morning. Like I don't have to play on the worship band. Tim was awesome, jumped in there for me. This is going to be a stress-free morning. And uh, then I showed up and realized I forgot to plug in all our wireless stuff this week, so it was dead, so I'm scrambling to do that. And then we had an issue with the kick drum making noise, and then we screens go out, and then we got phantom music just playing from somewhere, right? Like, I'll be honest with you, during that second to last song, I said, Lord, we, maybe we should just go home. It's no, 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 I know, I know that... Some of you get a little uncomfortable when I get a little too raw, but hey, even your pastors have a bad day, okay? And even they need to be reminded that what we're about to proclaim is still good, no matter what. And it's still true. And actually, because it's true, things like what happened this morning don't really matter in the scope of eternity, right? If you're still waiting for this church to be a performance-based, like, perfectly put-together church, then you probably need to go somewhere else. I'll help you find a place. We're, 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 not, we're not pushing for that. Um, we would like our screens not to go out, but for some reason that keeps happening every time someone flushes the toilet the wrong way. So... <laughs> No, no, keep flushing. We'll deal with those screens. <laughs> All right, Luke chapter 10. I, I just want to, I want to share a couple thoughts today. We're going to do something a little different. We're going to take communion here in a little bit, and I'll explain that, and we're just going to take some time to sit in it. But I want to go to a familiar story that if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard. You've probably never associated this story with the gospel or with communion. But ever since my wife's grandpa passed away a few, it's been a couple months ago now, I'm not exactly sure when it was, I think it's been about a little over a month, this was his favorite story, and it was really one of the first times I interacted with it as I was preparing to present the gospel at the funeral, and I'm like, how do you get there from here? And since then, this story has become one of my favorites because it is dripping with the gospel, and it's... I'm just kind of aware of how quick we are to make everything we do about us, right? How quick we are to make everything we do about us. One of our friends gets mad at us and doesn't want to talk to us, and what's the first thing we say? What did I do? Well, maybe you did nothing. Maybe they just got something going on, right? What did I do? One of my kids struggles, and the first thing I say is, where did I not prepare them. Where did I screw up? Where did I, where did I, like, how did I mess this up? Like, I just, I just, I think I'm becoming more aware of how much I make everything about me. And this morning, what I want to do together is to turn our eyes to the hope that we have. And I, let me just let you know on a secret. It has nothing to do with you. And so, as we take communion, that's one of the things that happens is we make it all about us. Some of us, if you grew up like I did, every time it's communion, you're like, oh, this is the time. I got to tell God all the things I did wrong. Because there's this one, this one text in 1 Corinthians 15 where it talks about people dying if they take communion wrong. And I don't know if I, I don't want to eat that bread and juice and die. So I better confess all that I did wrong. I better make, make this covenant with God that I will never do anything wrong again. And, and, and we miss out on what we're called to celebrate because we make it all about us. And so I want to share this story with you, a few thoughts. I don't even have an outline today. Then I want to share another story and then we'll take communion together. And we're, we're going to take some time just to sit in that and talk to our Savior today. Because it's really all about Him. Luke chapter 10. I'm going to start reading in verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, and here he tells the story, or you, the parable, which if you were here when we went through a parable series a little over a year ago, it talked about it being a window into heaven, a window into the way the kingdom works. Jesus tells these stories to let us know what his kingdom looks like. 
A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Now, if you grew up in church like me, you saw a flannel graph of this. Anybody? Yeah, and you're like, here comes the priest, looking all pimped out, right? And then, ooh, other side of the road, ooh, and the dude's sitting there. So too, verse 32, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, an unexpected bestower of grace, if you want to put it that way, a Samaritan, as he traveled by, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. A better translation would be he had compassion for him. We don't want pity, right? But we love, it's, it's nice to have someone be compassionate towards us, right? To feel what we feel and to move towards us in that. He took pity on him. He had compassion on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, putting on oil and wine. I don't know about you, but I just think this may, I think Valvoline and Boone's Farm. I, I don't know, anybody else just, didn't that weird? I don't think that's what he did, but I'm just wondering. Some of you are like, what have we done? I told Biker Bill one time when he was really struggling, I said, we'll come pray over you. I got some 10W30, we'll anoint you with it. And he's a mechanic, so he thought that was interesting. He wouldn't let me come though, but... So he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And, and, and the... <coughs> We don't have time to dive into the whole context here, but the, the, the hint behind that question is, who do you think loved him well? Before this, Jesus was answering a guy who said, who is my neighbor? After he's just been told to love his neighbor. And so when Jesus says, which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? What he's saying is, who do you think actually loved him like they should have? The expert in the law he replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, so go and do likewise. Will you pray with me? Father God, this is your word. Yahweh, you are eternal, self-existent, compassionate and gracious. You're good. You're holy. Your word is perfect and true, and we believe that, and we believe every time we struggle to understand something or it appears to be contradictory to us, we know that the problem is in us and not in you. Thank you for your revealed word today. Open up our eyes as we sit here. God, turn our eyes towards you. Help us to see who you are. Help us to stop making everything about us. to make it more about you. Thank you for giving us the remembrance of communion today, and I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd meet us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now here's what happens with the parable of the Good Samaritan. We've already tried to figure out who we are in this story. Right? This is the Sunday school lesson. Don't be like the priest. Right? Don't be like, number one, don't be like the robbers. Right? Don't be a jerk. Okay? Stop beating people up. All right? Okay. No, no, none of us in here are like that. No jerks in this room. Number two, don't be like the priest who should have stopped, but for fear of, of, he used his religion basically, for fear of becoming unclean and not being able to do his job, he stepped aside to the other side of the road. Okay, so his excuse was, um, well, I can't do what God's called me to do, so I'm not going to do what I should do right now. Okay, well, don't be like him. Then we have the Levite, who he just didn't want to help the guy. Didn't really have any good reason, other than he's a Samaritan, and I'm a Jew, and, or excuse me, the Samaritan comes later. We don't know this guy. I got ahead of myself. 
He goes across the other side. Don't be like him. Don't walk around and not care about people, right? And then what do we do? Say, oh, we should be like the Samaritan. And here's the application that usually we end up with is, I should help old ladies across the street. I should hold doors for people, right? And have you ever held a door for somebody and they like got mad at you? I'm just, just a moment of confession. I had someone like look at me weird one time and I just wanted to punch him. I'm like, I'm trying to be nice here. And now I'm conflicted in my soul because I want to shut it in your face. Right? And he, the struggle's real, guys, for all of us. But we usually say we should just be aware and doing good things to people. I don't really think that's the point of this story at all, actually. I think Jesus is pointing to himself. He has just actually gotten done. Now, he, he is giving some illustration on how to, how to love your neighbor and, and how we should live. But he had just gotten done telling his disciples that he was going to go die for the sins of the world at the beginning of ch chapter 10. They didn't get it. Scripture tells us they didn't get it because God, God kind of blinded their eyes to it. They, they were unable to understand it. And then Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And I think we do to it what we do to a lot of things is we put ourselves in the wrong place. And so I want to give you a little bit of a different slant on this today. You may disagree. You may think I'm wrong. That's okay. I think the person that I relate to the most in this story isn't the robber doing jacked up things, even though I got some of that. Anybody? Not that I've robbed anybody. I saw a look like, what? Or the priest who's using his religion as an excuse to not be compassionate. Or the Levite who just doesn't care enough to stop. And I know I'm not the good Samaritan because I don't really feel led all the time to be kind to people. Anybody else? Yes, yeah, so some of you. Some of you are like starting to. Like it's okay. We all know. We've talked to your spouse. We all know what you're like. So where do I fit in this story? And, and what I feel like the Lord wants to remind us of today is that this story is actually a picture of the gospel, and where you fit is actually right at the beginning. When you find a guy who's been journeying through life, broke down, jacked up, assaulted and beat and left for dead. Too many times I've tried to do things my own way, right? And I'm just going about my life and all of a sudden life jumps up and bites you. Anybody? Didn't expect that to happen. Didn't expect this to happen. Didn't expect to lose my job. Didn't expect to lose my spouse. Didn't expect for a kid to run away or whatever it might be, right? Like we, we, life just happens. Things just happen. And I think we just need to re remind ourselves this morning that where we actually fit in the story of God, which communion is trying to remind us of, where we actually fit is that we are been, have been found broken, jacked up, beaten, and left for dead. That's where we are. That's who we are in this story. Like, we get to play a part in God's story. It's just not the hero. <laughs> this is us. We read it in verses like this, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's us. All means all, and that's all, all means, y'all, right? Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. This is where we find ourselves in the story. So as we become to take communion, let's just ground ourselves on who we actually are in the story. We are the person who is broken, jacked up, left for dead, with no hope. That's where we are. So if you're like, man, I'm really glad I came today. This is a, a pick-me-up. But then we see the Good Samaritan come. And what I want to encourage us in is, yes, I do believe Jesus is saying, this is what it looks like to love your neighbor. You should be like the Good Samaritan. But what he's hinting at is actually, he is the Good Samaritan. I am actually the one who sees someone in their distress and takes pity on them, has compassion on them. In this story, the Good Samaritan had compassion and he moved towards the person who was hurting. We read about it like this in other parts of the New Testament. John 3, 16, for God so loved. So God, for God so took pity, for God so had compassion on the world that he gave, that he sent his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We read about it like this, straight from the life of Jesus, who is Yahweh in the flesh. He is the picture of who Yahweh looks like to us. 
Matthew 9, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He took pity. In this story, the Good Samaritan is Jesus. And he sees people who are broken down and jacked up, and I love this, he has compassion. He moves towards them. I'm 43 years old and I'm still recovering from a view of God that I don't know where it came from other than the world probably that says when God deals with my sin he is not compassionate he is angry he is mad man you jacked it up again Kevin anybody else hear that voice man walk, walking down the road and you're broke down left for dead you idiot you shouldn't have been walking by yourself that's kind of the voice of God I'm recovering from now I'm not Gen Z so I don't blame my parents <laughs> that's a good joke that was a good one come on guys I'm joking oh boy <laughs> lighten up a little bit <laughs> somewhere along the lines because of the world that we live in, because of the culture, because of lies that I believed. Uh, I've always saw God as like just this angry dude who is PO'd at my sin. And so every time I swear, or every time my anger comes out, or every time, whatever, fill in the blank, he's just so ticked. But actually what this story reminds us of, which is actually, I believe, what communion is pointing to, is that when God sees people when, who are broken down, jacked up, attacked, left for dead, when he sees us in our brokenness, his first response is to what? Move towards us. To have compassion for us. Yes, God is, he does get angry. We were actually going to talk about that in a few weeks. We're going to uh, look, start a series called Who Is Our God? And we're going to move it through that up into Easter. We'll talk about what it means for him to be slow to anger, that he does get angry. But that's not the baseline of who he is. And so as we think about our sin today, if we keep putting ourselves in the wrong spot in the story, it's real easy to make this all about us when we come to communion. All we do is focus on all the ways we've let God down. Let me tell you something. Every single person in this room has let God down. Equally. Like, oh man, I saw Joe walk in today and I know I'm not as bad as Joe. Yes, you are. Yes, I am. And what I know God did not want for us to do is when we gather to remember communion, to, to have a, an hour where we simply focus on how terrible we are. Because when he saw our terribleness, he moved towards us. He didn't run away. He didn't cross the street. He didn't use religion as an excuse. He didn't just abandon us. He actually moved towards us like the Good Samaritan did. And then he, the story tells us that he bandaged up the wounds of the man and took care of him at great cost to himself. He paid for his stay. All right, this is just dripping with gospel tones, guys. He bandaged up his wounds and took care of him at a great cost to himself. That reminds me of some scripture in Isaiah 40 or 53. Surely he, talking about the suffering servant, this is a prophecy hundreds of years before Jesus comes, but it's talking about the Messiah. And what he's going to do. Surely he, which we now know as Jesus, took up our pain. And bore our suffering. Well, that was a nice thing for him to do. Yet, here's what it cost him. We considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Here we have hundreds of years before a prophecy that says the Messiah will come and at great cost to himself, he will bring us healing. That's what we celebrate today. A God who has compassion on those who are attacked and beaten and left for dead. He moves towards us. He bandages our wounds and takes care of us. Now let me tell you a story. 
I heard this story, um, listened to a sermon by J.D. Greer a few months ago. I'll tell you the same thing he said. I don't know if it's true, but in our profession, we say that'll preach. All right, so I'm going to tell you the story because I think it'll help us get to what we're celebrating today. There's a story of an ancient king who reigns in a kingdom with multiple people, multiple hundreds of thousands of people under him. And he is known as a good, benevolent, and gracious king. But one day, someone comes to him and says, hey, king, someone is stealing from us. So the king gathers all the townspeople and says, hey, listen, there's plenty to go around. You just need to ask. Just come do it the way I'm asking you to do it, and we'll give you what you need to provide for your needs. There's plenty to go around. I'm good. I'm gracious. I'll give you whatever you want. Just don't steal. Thinking, all right, maybe they got it. Townspeople disperse a few more weeks. Messenger comes back and says, hey, king, someone's still stealing. Someone's still stealing. So this time he says, all right, well, here's the deal. Gather all the townspeople again. Look, I asked you guys not to steal. Someone's still doing it. So now we have to put a punishment for whoever gets caught doing it. The punishment is 40 lashes minus one, known at that time, as you know from Scripture, to be right up to the brink of death. Many people would die from the wounds that were caused during that. Townspeople disperse. King thinks, well, that'll stop it threat of punishment that'll stop it anybody ever have that work in your life the threat of punishment maybe for a little bit but then you're like oh I can get around that a few weeks later a messenger comes and says king I have some news we've caught the thief the king's like, well, why are you so downcast? Like, that's good news. We found the person who is stealing and breaking the law. Who is it? The messenger says, it's your mother. It's always the mom. <laughs> that was a joke. I want to clarify that. It's your mother. The king says, well, I need a few days. Give me three days, I need to figure out what we're going to do here. Torn between his compassion for his mom, but his justice that is necessary to rule a kingdom. Sin has to be punished, but he loves his mom. What's he going to do? And for three days, the entire town is talking about what's going to happen. The entire kingdom, what's the king going to do? In three days, everyone gathers again, and the king says, okay, I've made a decision. Tie her up. She needs to suffer the consequences of what she's done. You hear the, the hush of the crowd like, oh, no. So they bring his mom in and they tie her to the post. It's common back in, 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 in Bible times for there to be, a, in Roman culture especially, there to be a post in the middle of the city where people would be tortured. They bound her hands because she, so she doesn't run because no one's going to willingly sit there. I don't know the name of this guy. But the whipper comes in with the whip. He gets ready to begin the punishment, and the king steps down and says, Hold on. Hold on. He takes off his rope, exposes his back. He walks down, and he puts himself around his mother. No need for shackles, because he's not going to move. And he holds her. And he says to the guy who's got the whip, you can begin. The guy says, I can't, my king, if I do it, I will hit you. There is no way that I can bring the punishment on your mother without inflicting the pain on you. And the king says, I know, go ahead. That's an order. And so for 39 lashes, the king feels the weight of the whip. But he doesn't move he takes the penalty and in that he continues to be a king who is just because penalty has been given but he continues to be a king who is compassionate because he did not allow his mother to endure the pain of what she should have endured like i said i don't know if that story is true but when i heard it i thought isn't that the picture of the gospel it's a picture of a king who established a world and all we want to do is question why he did what he did. In, in our culture today, guys, all we want to do is talk about all the things we don't understand. 
But he's good and he's gracious and he's compassionate and he's kind and he's established it from the beginning of time. He moves towards people who are broken and jacked up. He shows up in Genesis 12 to establish a nation that will bless the earth. And through that nation comes the Messiah where all people can be saved. This is who our king is. He's full of grace. He's also a king of justice. And so when the time was right, he sent his son into the world. Why? So that he could become sin for us. So we could become the righteousness of God in him. That's what we celebrate today. And so just like the good Samaritan who at great cost to himself paid for the healing of this man, we see a picture of Christ. See, I would just dare to say today, most of the time this book is about him, not us. <laughs> But we're pretty quick to read ourselves into it. And then there's one more aspect of the Good Samaritan that I think points us to Christ in communion. He says to the innkeeper, look after him and when I return. See, one of the things Jesus said in 1 Corinthians 11, well, he didn't say it in 11, but it was recorded in 11. He said, do this as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. For in doing this, you proclaim the Lord's death until what? He comes. All week I had in my, I don't even know who sings this song. I heard it on the radio and I can't get out of my head. And it just says, people get ready. Jesus is coming soon. We'll be, and remember that? Going home. And I'm like in my car, like, like a rage. Like, he's coming. Because it's true. So why? Why that journey this morning? Because here's what I want us to understand. What we're about to do is not about you. Let's not cheapen the cross by making this about you. The one thing you and I bring to this equation is our sin. And all have sinned. There's not one person in this room who's out sinned the grace of God. There's not one person in this room who has done too many things for God to forgive. Let's not make this about you today. Let's not have someone sit in this room overwhelmed by guilt and shame of their sin. Because this is not about your sin. It's about what Jesus did to take away your sin. Now listen, there's some steps. There needs to be some confession. There needs to be some repentance, right? But... We make this about ourselves when we sit here and we're like, oh, God must be so mad at me. No, can I just, can you just hear me for a second? God gave us this to remind us his desire in our sin is to move towards us. He's not standing there like, oh, you're a little bit too dirty for me. Oh, you watched a movie you shouldn't have watched this week. Shame on you. Oh, you did that thing back in 2015. I'm still ticked about that. No. His desire is to move towards us. And as we have just bread and juice here, we're reminded in the, of the God who moved towards us. And in his body, Jesus Christ's body, he took the punishment for our sin. And by his blood, he paid for our freedom. So that he could become sin and we could become the righteousness of God. And let us not forget, he's coming back. I'm not going to go off on this point because I can tend to be a jerk about it, but some of y'all in this room, you are way too concerned with what's happening in this world. I'm not saying we're not supposed to care and we're not supposed to be salt and light. We are. But our hope is not in a government. Our hope is not in a ruler, our hope is not in anything other than a king who's coming back. And when he comes back, depending on your interpretation of Revelation, he's going to come back in a white robe on a horse, tatted up with a sword. Some of you are like, your tattoos are sending you to hell. No, nope, Jesus is coming back with a tattoo. <laughs> Read it. Don't come ask me about Revelation, all right? I'm still trying to figure it out myself. He's going to come back and he's going to make all things new. So these are the three things that we celebrate today. He moved towards us. He paid for our healing. And one day he's going to come back.
And so then we come to the table of communion. Here's where I want to just take a few minutes and we're just going to be still. Here at Grace, we believe that communion is for everybody who has put their faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus. The only people in this room who should not take communion is if you have yet to accept that Jesus Christ came and died and rose again for your sins. If you've not done that, then I would encourage you to not take communion because scripture is very clear. This has nothing to do with you except for the fact that he's calling you to come. <laughs> We don't believe you need to be a part of this church. We just believe that we as the body of Christ, the big church, celebrate together the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But what we celebrate is the God who's moved towards us. The God who's healed us. Now maybe you're in the middle of that healing. Anybody else just really tired of certain things that you just keep doing and you can't stop doing? <laughs> I just wish I didn't get angry so much. Anybody? I had to confess to my wife this week. I said, hey, I'm just not very compassionate and gracious. Like, mercy's not at the top of the list of things God gave me. Anybody else? Like, and I kind of take that on you sometimes. I'm sorry. And you know, she's good. She's like, yeah, you're not bad. But I don't want to give the, like, that healing that Jesus paid for, we have, this, we have this treasure in Philippians chapter 1 that says this, He who began a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion the day of Jesus Christ. And so maybe you're in the middle of that healing. God's desire for you is still compassion. He's still moving towards you. He's not in heaven like, oh my goodness, it's February, whatever it is, 2024, and Kevin is still angry. I'm going to take my sin back. I'm going to take my blood back. It's not how he's looking at me. He's doing something. And one day he's going to come and completely transform us. So here's what I want to push us to do this morning, guys. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, the elders are going to come up. We're going to pass out the elements, and we're going to do it a little differently than we have recently. We're going to pass out just the bread first. And I'm just going to encourage you. We, 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 we celebrate the bread and the juice because the bread, as Jesus taught us, is a picture of his body given for us to take the penalty for us. And I want to encourage you while we're passing the bread out, some of you need to stop trying to pay for your own sin. You're not going to do it can't do enough good to pay for it can't beat yourself up enough to pay for it can't bear down and just do better you never know the only way is to let your sin be paid for by jesus and he took the punishment that we deserved and so i just want to encourage you to talk to your god thank him for that and maybe if you're in this spot and you still got some sin that you're trying to pay for you can just let it go today i'm going to trust holy spirit to do his work on that i can't do it and then we're going to pray and we'll take the bread together. Then we're going to pass out the juice. And the juice is a representation of Jesus' blood, which buys for our forgiveness. So not only has the penalty been paid, but we've, it's been completely erased. And we can be entered and we can enter into relationship with God. And the juice brings with it a promise. Jesus said, I will not drink again of this fruit of this vine until what? I drink it with you in the kingdom. So as we take the juice, we don't just remember the fact that he wiped away our sins. We remember the fact that one day we're going to drink some juice with Jesus. If you're Baptist, you're going to drink grape juice with Jesus. If you're not, you're going to drink wine with Jesus, okay? I'm not sure which one, where it is. I'm, and, I, and I hope it's not Boone's Farm because that's disgusting. But here, here's the deal. As we sit and pass the juice out, could we just take the time to thank God for cleansing us and giving us the promise that he's going to come back. And I don't know what, what's going on in your life today. I got my issues, you got yours. The one constant is this, we have a good Savior who's given us this to remember him. So let's not make it about us. Amen. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the elders to come on up. And then hopefully we have some music. Maybe that random music that was playing before will come back. That'd be great. I'm going to pull the lights down a little bit just because it's really bright in here. Um, give us some time just to talk to the Lord. So would you pray with me? Father, as we enter this moment, your word tells us to be still and know that you are God. As we enter this moment, 
We're reminded that your word says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we believe that you are a real, personal God who responds in relationship to us, and you are in this place. I don't doubt that for one second. You are here. And you know what we're walking through. You know what we're holding on to. You know what we haven't let go of. You know everything. It's not one thing you don't know. And your movement towards us is not one of anger and frustration or moving away from in guilt and shame, but it is a movement towards us out of compassion because you care for us. You feel what we feel and you move towards us to remedy that. And I thank you for that. So Lord, in this moment, just meet us in this place. Come do what only you can do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.